But um, thank you guys for being here that are here. And um, I'm Jerry Wald, your host. Welcome to Let's Talk Stroke. I am a stroke survivor as well. And I do these shows to bring, out, bring awareness to stroke, TBI, aphasia, um, brain injury in, in a nutshell. So um, I also wanted to provide a platform for all survivors to share their story, what they're going through, and, um, and also to bring on experts in brain health and share their knowledge. And also I bring on other experts in physical therapy that they can help us and teach us new things. So today's guest is Patrick Corley, and he is a doctor, doctor of physical therapy. And, um, and I also I had a guest on about two weeks ago, a little less, Deborah St. Clair, and she um, is also Patrick's therapist. So pretty awesome. So anyway, um, please ask questions. Um, this is the time to ask the question to a professional doctor of physical therapy and um, make comments and feel free to um, um, subscribe to my YouTube channel, Let's Talk Stroke. So, um, and also you probably see my, looks like if I'm dirty, it's, yeah, actually it's Ash Wednesday today. So Barbara and I went to church and that's the result. So anyway, um, why don't we go ahead and get started, you guys. All righty, Farron, I see you out there. Yeah, long time no see. Glad you're here. Marina, thanks for being here. Rosanna and salute. And um, let's go ahead and not waste any time and bring on Patrick. What's going on, Jerry? Hey, everybody. How we doing? You're doing good. Doing good. Yeah. A little, a little dark on your side, just to let you know. Okay. Hold no on. big deal. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Little, <laughs> there you go. No. So, um, so good to see you here. So good to see you too. Yeah. It's um, you were having a little issue with the getting on. Yeah. Right? Initially, the link wanted to give me trouble. It couldn't just be easy, Jerry. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Trust me, I understand. Um, <laughs> Thank you for you guys being here. I see you, Danielle. Thank you for being here. And um, again, ask questions because uh, here is the expert, a doctor of physical therapy. Well, you know, I've been to therapy so, so much. Perfect. Well, um, what is a doctor of physical therapy? Maybe you can tell your background, who you are. and Yeah. So um, I went to uh, school at the University of Scranton in Pennsylvania. I actually did my undergrad there. Uh, and my doctorate there. Um, so my undergrad was in exercise science. I had a concentration in nutrition as well. Um, I'm originally from uh, Huntington, New York. Um, so I've had a little bit of taste of everything between New York, Pennsylvania, and then I also practiced in Georgia for a while, uh, which is where I met Deb, who was on your show. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, so I did three years to get my uh, undergrad. I graduated a year early and then I uh, worked in a physical therapy clinic for a year. And then I ended up going back because I knew that's what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I did my three years for my doctorate um, at Scranton. Um, so when I graduated, I was practicing in New York for a little while. And then I ended up moving to Georgia. Um, I was there for almost three years and I got a role as a clinic director there uh, as well. So I've kind of uh, seen a lot of different avenues, a lot of different clinics, and uh, I'm back in New York now practicing. And, um, you know, I'm fortunate to have a job that I love what I do. Yeah. Uh, I get to in pe impact people's lives on a daily basis. So, oh, absolutely. You know, it's not, not to change the subject, Scranton, my mother was born there, and uh, Huntington, I, I lived in Long Island for many years. Um, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I know it's funny. We we talked several times, and, and never, I, but when I saw your bio and all that, uh, Huntington, I mean, pretty close. Yeah, Lake Ronkonkoma, you know. So, okay, okay, yeah. not so, bad. Yeah, nice to see you guys, Nancy. Ask questions. Look at you guys all here. It's really great. Aloha! Look at that. <laughs> yeah, so you can see the comments. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, so, uh, therapy. I mean, I've been to a lot of therapy. And um, 
you had a lot of uh, we were talking about what um, what you thought you can uh, share with everybody today. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of different aspects, obviously. So I just to give a little bit of background to everybody else, I work in outpatient physical therapy. So um, in terms of the the population that I get to see, I get to see, you know, people that are appropriate for outpatient physical therapy and, you know, they have their own set of goals. And uh, I enjoy, um, you know, working with all different populations, but specifically uh, working with more chronic conditions of, you know, a lot of times you've, you've seen people that have had therapy in the past and, you know, have kind of been discouraged because maybe they didn't get the best therapy. And that's kind of one of the disclaimers I wanted to put out there is that, you know, I think you guys talk about it all the time, but you want to, you want to be an advocate for yourself, right? So you want to make sure that you're getting the care that you need and you want to make sure that you have a physical therapist that's willing to take you there. Um, you know, there's a lot of different aspects of the healthcare system these days, and it's really important um, that you find a therapist that you feel fit to you, that suits you, and that is, you know, driven to help get you better and help you achieve the goals that you want to achieve. And, you know, a lot of times, unfortunately, you may have possibly a therapist that, you know, feels like this is where you're at and this is what it's going to be. And, you know, I couldn't feel any more but the opposite. I always feel like you can, you know, always have an opportunity to make something better um, and can always work towards a goal. Um, so, you know, my first piece of advice was make sure that you have the right therapist, that you have a therapist that believes in you, that believes that you can get better and is willing to be creative and think outside the box in order to get you there. And, you know, if that's the case, you know, you may have to challenge your therapist. You may have to say, hey, I'm, I'm still having difficulty with these things. Like, what can we do? What can we do differently? You know, it, you shouldn't be doing the same subset of exercises all the time progressively. Um, you know, it should be changed up. And, you know, you should be looking at the issues that you're faced with on a daily basis that you need to impact and, you know, start moving the needle towards that direction. Right. What do you think of the word? Because I know this is a, no one likes to hear this at all. You know. I've been told a long time ago, but, uh, um, plateau. That's a, yeah, <laughs> uh, that, that's not a word I like. Um, yeah. I understand, um, the sense in which some people use it, but I just don't agree with it. Like if, you know, if you're willing to put the work in and, you know, we're able to use all the knowledge that we have to, you know, be able to create a plan around getting there. Um, there should be no reason why you can't improve something. Um, there should be no reason why you can't work towards something that you want to do. Um, and it's really important that you have that mindset. And we talked about this a lot. Your mindset is so key, right? You need to, you, you guys are dealing with enough. You need to have that positive mindset so that you can impact your overall recovery. And as we know, you know, the, uh, the brain controls the body and you need to have that right. You need to ha uh, be able to drive yourself and push yourself to accomplish something. And, you know, a lot of times having that positive outlook that you can make something better, that you can have, uh, a, you know, a good impact on the things that you need to work on. Um, it starts there. And then, it, you know, that's just starts with your attitude and how driven you are. And then on top of it, you know, you need some tools to get there. And that's that's what our job is. Right. Absolutely. And um, what was the thing we were talking about is uh, neuroplasticity, which is huge. Yes. Yes. Neuroplasticity is huge. Um, I think it's a huge concept that everybody uh, needs to understand in terms of, you know, your recovery and that other areas of the brain can take up um, to channel a signal um, through a different pathway in order to accomplish the same task. You know, so just because an area and injury injuries, uh, injured area of the brain tissue is damaged doesn't mean that your brain can't figure out a way to rewire and essentially accomplish a task. Um, and, and that's the important aspect of that is, and that's why you want to continue to try to work towards the things that you can't do. You know, if you just kind of give up on those things, we talked about it. I mean, you, you can't expect something to get better if you don't work on it. Right. Hmm. So the thought, the thought of, you know, again, this is all I can do. Um, it, it's really important that you take a step towards those goals, even the ones that you have the most difficulty with, because you will see progress over time. And really, that's the thing is it it takes consistency over time. You know, unfortunately, nothing comes overnight, as you guys know. Um, it would be really nice if it did, but it doesn't. So, right. you know, staying motivated and and continuing to put the work in so that you can, you know, 
get to where you need to be. Eventually, you will see those changes over time, and the people around you will see those changes over time. Yeah, and that's the thing we talked about. Dave is asking a question here. Um, you probably saw that come up there. Um, uh, okay, is there a difference between a therapist and a trainer? Yes. There's a gigantic difference between a therapist and a trainer, and they both have their place, to be honest yeah. with you. Um, so a therapist has a much deeper grasp of anatomy um, and how um, different concepts uh, are to be applied, also how to assess you, how to understand um, you know, the deficits of whether it's a joint or the muscles or the nerves and how they're being innervated. Um, and which areas of your brain and your nervous system are responsible for where we have a thorough education on that. I can promise you that, you know. Yeah. Um, so it starts with, you know, we start off in school with anatomy, cadaver labs, really understanding, getting a deep grasp of the body and what it looks like and how it functions, you know. And over that three years time that I thought was never going to end, um, you know, I learned a lot along the way. Plus, you know, we're exposed to um, you know, different clinical internships where we get to see different sides of things. And that's probably where I gain an appreciation for working with the neurologic population. Yeah. And I, and I agree. And I, I don't, well, before I really needed a therapist when I had my, uh, my stroke, I, but when I meet and work with like you therapists, as far as the doctor or therapist, wow. I mean, we don't give enough credit. Mm -hmm. what you what you do it's just amazing um i appreciate that yeah 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 i've been through therapists for you know 10 years and wow and and but i know i, I kind of drumble around here but you know the, the funny thing is is we talked yes yesterday and about you know people that um see us on a daily basis may they may never see the quick changes or any changes but when I see somebody that I haven't seen in just say a year, then they say, wow, you've improved. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's uh, like I said, that consistency over time. And sometimes it's hard to see yourself. And maybe that's something that you need to understand about your recovery as well. Yeah, exactly. Um, Jana, nice to see you. Deborah, Laura, good to see you. Um, and Susan. Um, the ending of the, some of the commentary, kind of, you know, love to see them. And ask questions, guys. Josh, nice to see you. Um, the ending of the longest journey begins with the first step. Good point. Good point. Yeah. Yes, that's true. That's true. Um, you know, and a lot of times we think that things may be overwhelming that we can't overcome. And uh, one of the phrases that I like to use that my dad always told me was, you know, how do you eat an elephant? You eat it one bite at a time. You know, and that's the reality. It's <laughs> a good point. Yeah. Um, yeah. There, um, you know, there was another thing about the, uh, what kind of therapy do you do that um, maybe some other people, because I know I, I deal with a lot of different um, therapists, but when you get to a doctorate of therapy. Yeah. That's so a different language. Yeah. It really comes down to, our skill level with assessment and screening and um, utilizing research. Um, there's a lot of good research out there that we should be paying attention to over the years and that we've probably learned in school or whatnot um, that we should be using in clinic for you guys. And one simple example of that um, would be, you know, a, a lot of people are worried about their risk of falling and yeah. that's a you know very valid concern, right? You know, nobody wants to have a fall and nobody wants to injure themselves. And also that can obviously delay your recovery as well, right? So it's the last right. thing that everybody wants. Um, so there's a lot of good tests and measures out there, even some very simple ones that your therapist could be using um, to assess your level of risk, whether it's low, medium, high risk. Um, you wanna understand where you're at. And also some of those exams will tease out what you're having difficulty with and what you need to work on in order to get better. So it's really important that your, your therapist should be using what we call evidence-based 
practice where they're you know, utilizing research to give you the best outcome. They're categorizing you based on norms of people who go through the same thing that you do um, and being able to understand where you're at with that and where they need to take you. So if you're a medium or high risk patient, I want to get you at minimum in that low risk category so that you feel more confident doing things at home where I could advance your home exercise program and have you do things that previously you could only do with me, but now you can do on your own at home. So I think that's an important thing. Yeah. And I always say, take the T out of can't because so many times we say, <laughs> yes. you know, I, I can't Absolutely. do this. So I'm nervous about that. Um, with me, I think when we talked, uh, when I, when I broke my hip, I had to put on an AFO again, and it's been two years. I still haven't taken off. I mean, there, at home, I real careful, but I, I'm nervous about taking it off again. But yeah. you get, and I'll I'll send the link to Deborah in just a second because she, she you work there currently. Yeah, so uh, you know, Deb and I worked together for um, about a year, um, and she at the time that I had saw her, uh, I had seen her rather. She was still in her AFO, um, and I think too often um, the AFO doesn't get evaluated well enough. Like it should be evaluated continuously for those of you who don't know, you know, initially when you have a stroke after you may need that AFO, but we may see things recover over time. So, you know, we should be looking at your ankle and are you able to activate yeah. the muscles that you need to activate to be able to lift the foot better? Um, and what kind of innervation do you have? And are you are you capable of activating that muscle? We should also be looking at things from an orthopedic perspective, which means I should be looking at the joint. Is the joint stiff and it can't move well? And because you've been stuck in this AFO, does it need to be moved? Do I need to do hands-on treatment in order to get this joint moving so that you can use your muscles better? Things like that should be looked at. And too often I see that it's almost like a set it and forget it approach where they give you this AFO and you use it for years and nobody ever looks to see if you still need it again or could we progress you out of it do you have enough activation that we could progress you out of it there's also different forms of afos and like spring loaded and how much assistance you may need so if you have a spring let's say that's assisting you that you don't need that assistance you know that's something you may want to look at um you obviously you know certain people need a afo that has a hinge Certain people need it where it's you know kind of caught in one position. These things should be reevaluated to see if you need this later on as you continue to recover. Absolutely. And, and there's another question here from Larry. Thanks for being here, Larry. Good to see you. If you could see that he had a... Uh, let me see. Uh, Larry, I had a rotator cuff surgery to my affected side. What exercises do you recommend for strengthening? Um, it's a little bit deeper question than that. A, it... it depends on what tendons you had repaired. Um, and uh, we could definitely talk a little bit um, more um, privately um, in terms of what the factors are, when was the surgery, um, you know, where you're at at this stage of the, the game and, and what needs to be worked on. Um, but there's there's definitely a lot of good rotator cuff exercises that are out there as long as it's you know safe and the right time for you to do them. Um, I'd be happy to kind of coach you on that if you reach out to me privately. Wow, that'd, that'd be great. Yeah, because uh, I don't know, I don't know, Larry, if you had a um, what a subluxation because that I have that. Do you? What do you re recommend for that? Yeah, well, it definitely comes down to strengthening, and you know, it, it may not even be just having. You know, you're talking about subluxation of your shoulder, your glenohumeral joint, as we're talking about there. Yeah. Um, you know, but you may need stability of that joint, but you also maybe need stability in your shoulder blade to stay that. That's your that's your base. So there's plenty of other areas that we can work on in addition to the area that you're having the subluxation to try to give more inherent stability. Um, you know, sometimes even core strength plays a role in that. Right. Um, so it, it is a lot of strengthening. Um, there's certain specific exercises that we would look at for, to help stabilize the joint. Um, you know, again, a lot of these things are case dependent on which joint and what we're doing. Um, but you probably want to progress yourself from you know, kind of open chain exercise, we would call them where your arm is not planted or your legs not planted to then more closed chain exercise where your arm is planted and you're taking weight through that arm or leg. Um, and that closed chain tends to be more functional. And our push as, you know, doctors of physical therapy is to 
try to uh, rehab you and train you in a functional fashion, right? Yeah. It should be things that you need to do on a, on a continuous basis. And our exercises and our programs should be geared towards that. Yeah. It, it's just to go back to, um, I hope my other therapists are not listening, but uh, um, no one ever really evaluated me with, you know, take the AFO off and, you know, look, yeah. you know, yeah, letting it out. You know, it, and I've found that you, you can't just assume that everything's been done right up to the point that I've gotten yeah. this patient. You know, you hope it has. You hope that every doctor's done the right thing for you or whoever sized you for the brace did the right thing for you. Right. But, you know, with the level of knowledge that I have, you know, I can't I can't uh, look myself in the mirror if I don't do the extra work it takes to make sure that somebody has the right thing. And sometimes it takes time, but it's time that's well worth it. And you know, could save somebody years of recovery by getting them out of that and being able to use it. Um, not to say there aren't certain cases where you need it, and there is, yeah. but you should be assessed for that. It should say, you know what, I don't see enough muscle activation that you could safely not have this. And that should be a discussion between you and your therapist. Yeah. So so we as patients, we should bring it up, even though if they don't bring it up, we should just bring it up anyway. Yeah, two things that have you know haven't been addressed. If you have an AFO and nobody's looked at it to see if you have enough muscle activation and or if your joint mobility is the way it should be for you to utilize that joint. Um, on, t on the other aspect was I talked about the fall risk. You know, yeah. those are two things that your therapist should easily be able to assess. And I'm sure if you bring it up to them, they they would be more than happy to do it. And obviously, you're showing that you're committed to your recovery as well. Yeah, absolutely, definitely. Yeah. Um, Awesome, David. It was actually uh, Patrick, all his ideas, because I really don't know. You know <laughs> what it was, but. That's right. I'll, I'll let Jerry take credit, you know? Yeah, please. Someone, somebody give me credit once. But uh, I have so many questions that I um, want to ask you, but you had some. Uh, but what else do you suggest when somebody's brand new? I mean, like, I just had my throat, because I mean, you deal with probably patients from day one till. Yeah. I, I mean, I have seen patients relatively acutely. Obviously, you may go through the process of going through a rehab first before you get to me in the outpatient setting. Yeah. And uh, I was actually thinking about it. It'd be really, really cool to maybe get involved uh, therapists from every setting, maybe like the acute setting, the rehab setting to talk to you guys as well. You know, I speak spe specifically to the outpatient setting. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, but usually when when I get somebody who's a little bit more acute, you know, it's really important that we understand maybe what's working well and what's not working well and what can we facilitate, you know, whether it be muscle activation um, or balance, uh, whatever it is that we need to address right away as the most important things to get you going to where you need to be. And a lot of times it's the more functional things. It's the, you know, changing positions, getting, you know, in and out of a chair, walking, you know, yeah. walking for longer distances, walking with an assisted device, trying to get away from using an assisted device, or maybe changing the assisted device that you're using. Maybe you're using a walker and you want to get to a cane, so eventually you won't need it. You know, I'm, I'm trying to assess where are you at in this stage of the process? How much were you affected? Were you effective cognitively? Were you affected physically? Um, you know, was your balance system thrown off? What do we need to know at this stage of the game? And a lot of those tests and measures that I talked to you guys about help us tease that out. And we should be using our evaluative skills to understand your full picture. You know, we have your exam. We know what's going on with you from an objective perspective from our side. We also understand what's going on with you and your life and what's important right. to you. You know, maybe you want to play with your grandkids or whatever, whatever is most important to you. That's what we should be working on because quite honestly, it's what's going to get you most motivated too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I see uh, Larry said no subluxation surgery was in October. Don't know exactly which tendon. But yeah, and Larry, you, you want to send me a message and I can put you in touch um, over here. So absolutely. Yeah, we can definitely talk a little bit further about that. And, you know, on the on the flip side of that, we'll keep your, your medical information private, too. <laughs> <laughs> we all hit the whatever. No, no, I'm kidding. I don't know. No, but also. Um, I'm sure, I don't want to say everybody, but I know even with me, I swing my leg. You know, like I told you, my grandkids say I walk like a penguin, you know, swinging the leg out. Um, yeah. So that's called that circum because, circumduction. Circumduction, um, yeah. Yeah. So you, you bring up a very good point because, 
you know, in reality, that's another thing that we need to look at, right? So are you circumducting because some of the muscles that you would utilize to walk normally are not working? Um, or are they not working well, and we need to work on those muscles in order for you to, you know, be able to utilize or, or maybe it's the joints not moving well, you know, a lot of these things get affected, maybe it's the tone you have, you know, we need to look at different aspects of that, how can we influence it? And, you know, what's the what's the best route for you. And a lot of times I find that when we tease out, there is some muscle activation, it's just working on a very low level. And I need to start you on a basic level so that I can build it up. First, I need to get you to recruit this muscle and show you how to recruit it. Uh, Once I can get you to recruit that muscle, then we can start looking at maybe functional ways of using it. Right. I, I see uh, um, Jana. I, I can bring it up here too. She, if I bring the right one up. Have you had clients who had one side colder than the other? Any advice on? to improve that? One side colder than the other. So that could be a couple things. One, it could be maybe blood flow, blood flow related, um, which you know probably depends on what your specific situation is. Um, or it could be a sensory mechanism that's off um, where you're getting like a cold sensation. Um, you know, and there might be some different aspects of like, maybe desensitizing that nerve uh, exercises or things that you can do, you know, kind of exposing yourself to different substances or, um, you know, maybe we can look at ways to um, get that nerve to operate a little bit better by challenging it. Right. So what do you think about, uh, 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 there was two of them. One was um, um, Botox and then the other one I was, I was thinking of K-Tape because I've used that, Kinesio tape, if anybody knows in that. Yeah. So, I mean, the Botox, I have seen that, you know, for for somebody with a significant increase in tone and we're able to kind of get that to, to calm down and, and, and use that area a little bit better. I have seen some success with that. Uh, I think it, you know, it depends on the person. Um, it's not always, you know, everybody's solution, but there are certain instances where, you know, if you're having such a hard time getting past uh, that hypertonicity, um, and getting some movement out of an area, if you can, you know, have something assist in getting that area to relax so that you can utilize it. Um, I've seen that be beneficial, in which case you probably need to work on moving that joint well, loosening that joint up first, which again, maybe we have some hands on approaches that we should be utilizing, in addition to, um, you know, giving you some exercise to help move that. And I only say that, Jerry, because sometimes what ends up happening is that we, as therapists, we only look at you as a neurologic patient. Right. And we don't look at you as an orthopedic patient as much as we should. And really, that's it's important. It's important that we do both. We look at the fact that, yes, there is something neurologically driven here that we are, you know, working to, to modify things around. Um, but at the same time, just because you have a neurologic condition doesn't mean that there aren't orthopedic issues like joints being too stiff and not moving well, especially being stuck um, with increased tone for a long time. Right. Good, good to hear that. And I see it. Jana, so if you remember that name, Jana Towns, with, um, she wants to know if you could uh, private message. Yes. Yeah. We'll definitely, uh, we'll definitely scan through and get a list of people that we need to talk to. And, you know, I'm more than happy to talk to people about any, uh, any questions that they have. That's, that's perfect. Um, and, uh, and Dad's there. Yeah, I know I'm sending you a link in just a few here. Um, but I, I know I, same here with me, the, the K tape taping, like it will yeah. have immediate help, but it, is it temporary or do, does it help, you know, when you take it off, because you can use it and I mean, take it, you can take a shower with it. Yeah. Me. Yeah. So, you know, I have used Kinesio tape in the past. Um, you know, the one difficulty that we have with Kinesio tape is there's not, we haven't had good research on it yet, which yeah. you know, I talked about how important it is as therapists that we're practicing uh, evidence-based practice, that we're looking at the research and utilizing what should be done with our patients. To be honest, there's not good research on it yet um or at this time so you know that's one factor to look at but the reality is that if i'm utilizing a technique and something is helping the thought is that kinesio tape doesn't necessarily provide support 
but it more so provides input through the skin. And their their thought process and their schooling and kinesio taping is that by providing certain input through the skin, you can maybe help activate a muscle better um, for stability, or maybe you can help uh, downregulate a muscle better so that it's not as active. Um, those are kind of the approaches with that. I've gotten away from that a little bit, but the reality is if you're doing something and it's helping, you know, I don't necessarily think that it's wrong. Um, it's just, you know, it's not something I would rely on completely, but if it's yeah. supplemental to your overall recovery, I'm okay with it. Absolutely. And um, I'll go through some of these. I'm sure you see it, but uh, Marina just said she'll be, she also will be messaging you, messaging you. And then Cheryl left side was bad. Felt like I had a cement on my foot, but holistic chiropractic adjusted me feel way better. Yeah. So that, that kind of leads to that, um, you know, that factor we talked about of, you know, just because there's neurologic deficits, um, you know, it could be that, you know, you need to get a joint moving, that you need to release something or yeah. you know, loosen up a joint capsule um, in order to get that joint moving that is stuck. Um, and in your case, I'm glad that it worked out. Yeah. And, and it's funny. I see all these, they call it kinesio tape. K tape is kind of for short, but yeah, I mean, I see Janice is saying, uh, Yvonne, they both, they want to know what the K tape is or what, uh, but, but yeah, that Janice lives, Janice, I know everybody, there's lots so many people. And if you, if you want to tell where you're from, cause I know they're all over the, the world here. So, uh, um, and I appreciate you guys being here, but yeah, it is called K tape, even though I'm not promoting it or nothing. I just, yeah, I yeah, it. I actually have it here, but I can't put it on myself. Um, it wouldn't, you know, with my bad, not bad arm, but the weak arm. So, yeah, yeah, the effect is sad. Uh... Okay, so Mar Marina, oh, thank you. I know Janet from Canada, uh, Michigan, thank you guys for that. Uh, Marina saying, so does that AFOs really help the drop foot, or is there something else that helps? Um, so, uh, there's a, there's a couple of different things. Um, but the AFO is really just supposed to be a support mechanism, right? A so, yeah, crutch, so to speak. Yeah, yeah and, and that's why I talked about, you know, there's different details of it that may give you more mobility or more use, and you want to look into those factors. Like, it should be supplemental. Um, again, some people don't have activation and they need it right. because that makes them safer and more functional. Um, you know, is there an alternative to an AFO? Um, you know, at this time, not necessarily, um, but you do want to look at that aspect of how much could you activate outside of that AFO if you do have some activation, do have some use. Maybe there's some safe circumstances where you don't have to use that and you can get some functional carryover at home. Um, for instance, I may have a patient that I say, you know what? Um, this muscle is able to activate and you're able to lift your foot slightly and you're able to utilize this muscle. Um, you know, you, since we've been working on it and at this stage of the process, you're safe to maybe walk around the house so that you get that carryover of utilizing that muscle. Yeah. You know, I can give you an exercise to specifically engage that muscle, but you walking and utilizing that muscle, that's going to promote much more carryover than me giving you just one specific exercise to do, you know, a couple times a day. Um, so it's really looking at that aspect. Um, yeah, so that's the kind of the biggest thing. Um, there are some things called uh, functional electric stimulators, yeah. um, which have some timing mechanisms to um, help elicit a, a nerve. Um, but that really, again, is for specific cases um, and sometimes isn't always appropriate. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've used that when I broke the hip. They put it on my thigh. You're talking about the... Uh, what's the so you're talking about uh, electric stimulation, okay. which, which is, um, there's a couple of different aspects of electric stimulation. Sometimes it's used for pain. Um, other times it's used for uh, muscle recruitment. Um, so there, there are instances where it's appropriate. Um, I think the one you're talking about is for pain. 
Um, and the thought between uh, behind electric stim is that if you have a sensation that is going through that same nerve pathway that you're getting pain through, then that pain signal can't go up that same nerve pathway while you're getting that stimulation. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was a, um, I don't know what they call it. Um, hey, Robert, nice to see you. Uh, uh, TENS, unit, TENS unit? Yeah, TENS unit, yep, yep. Yeah, and that's what I used it to help lift my leg because you know, from my like calf, my leg. Oh, okay, so that. you did use it for that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and and some of that is is it can be very effective in the sense that you know you're providing a, another stimulus to help that nerve uh, help get that contraction, um, and if you can you know start eliciting a contraction and start using that muscle, the thought is that you'll be able to recruit it better in the future. Right. Exactly. No, I, I always I think I asked you this the other day because um, I see I saw a few people out here saying when we mentioned about me swinging the leg out. Um, yeah. Um, a lot of people, they do that. And I but most, I don't say most, but a lot of brain injury, stroke survivors, that's kind of how you do that. Is that because we're lifting, not lifting the leg up? Um, when we you know, walk? Yeah, so you're using a, a different subset of muscles in order to get that walking motion. A lot of time it's because, yes, you, you can't elevate that foot and you can't elevate your at your hip, and you can't clear your foot from the ground well enough. So right. what you do is you kind of swing it out to the side to avoid that mechanism mechanism of having to lift it up. Um, if you're able to utilize some of the muscles that allow you to lift it up, my suggestion is to continue to work at that and encourage that. Um, there are times when you want to maybe discourage swinging the leg out to the side and, and focus on recruiting the muscles that are a little bit weaker or not kicking in as well. Um, you know, that would be the important thing. But again, this is case dependent where maybe yeah. somebody doesn't have that activation and that is the way that they can walk well um, or the best that they can. And in which case I may want to actually make those muscles stronger. I may want to encourage those muscles more and make them even stronger because that's what they need to use in order to function. And one way or another, we need to get this done. So it's important to kind of analyze what somebody can and can't do um, mm -hmm. or what they need to work towards and either, you know, build up what they're compensating with because that's the way that they can do it um, or encourage them to kind of focus on the things that they're having trouble do doing and can't do uh, and, and work with that from there. Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, so then this I, I I kind of go along with this though with Cheryl. I know why I do it. My left side neglect, so I have to really pay attention. Yes, um, what the left side is doing, and that's the thing. I, I do the same thing. You know, I know I have to lift it or do the right thing, but but I just I forget, and that all that's my dumb excuse that I had a stroke, my short term memory, or there's so many things to concentrate on. Yeah, it's it's very common, and you know, some sometimes it's just a matter of you know being mindful or continually having it pointed out to you, and then it you know it's something that you have to relearn and get used to, and and keep reminding yourself to to utilize. Right, right, exactly. Um, Robert, nice to see you. Um, he, he says, great discussion. Are you allowed to recommend the best AFOs for foot lift? I mean. You know, the one I wear is a com composite. What do you call that? Composite stuff. It's like feels like steel, but it's not. It's a black. But it. I've had it for years, and I. I don't know what the name of it is, but um, it does have the springs on it. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I don't have a specific recommendation like, oh, this is the best one on the market, or. Um, you know, and again, you know, each person is going to be different yeah. in terms of what, what activation they do have in that area or don't have, um, you know, everybody needs, everybody's needs are going to be a little bit unique. Um, you know, so I, I would say it's a combination of maybe working with an orthotist and working with a physical therapist and get them to communicate on, you know, where you're at and make sure that it's being looked at from both sides because we have assessment skills and they have assessment skills and there's yeah, a reason why yeah. they're doing something. Um, but we need to, we get to see you more often. You know, we get to see you, um, you know, hopefully multiple times a week for a longer period of time. You know, sometimes you go in for an evaluation with an orthotist and, you know, that's about the time that they get to see and get to know you and what right. you need. 
So it's it's maybe important more so to have that cross communication or ask your therapist what you need to discuss with them when you when you're uh, either a going to reevaluate what you have already. Um, and, and sometimes it's about asking the right questions. Like I said, just so, like I said, with your challenging your therapist, you know, you could also say the same to your doctor, your orthotist, that do I need this? Is there anything I could have that wouldn't be as restrictive that I could utilize more activation and things of that nature? Yeah. And, and um, Robert says, thanks for that. And uh, I know Janice is saying, you're all my heroes. And I think the well, you're all my heroes too, but therapists, wow. I mean, <laughs> Where, where would we be without you? Yeah, it, it's, uh, you know, I'm happy that, um, you know, the awareness of what we do is growing yeah. um, and that, you know, hopefully we're utilizing our skill sets in the right way to, to give you guys the best outcomes. Um, you know, so it's, uh, it means a lot to me and I know a lot of therapists out there that you guys appreciate the work that we do. Right. Um, you know, that's literally what, what keeps me going on a daily basis. And, yeah, that's what I love to hear. Yeah, exactly. It's more rewarding for you when you have to hear those comments. and, and Absolutely. Yeah, and, you know, kind of working on something together. Um, and, you know, when, when we get to, you know, experience the the success with you guys and, and, and see things change over time, or like I said, maybe you're not even aware of it. We see something change and we've been assessing something and we get to tell you, look, this is where you're at. Look out, look at what you can do now, you know? Yeah. It's always Absolutely. the best part. Yeah, exactly. And, and you're, I mean, you have your own practice too, and that is you're busy all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I definitely stay busy, uh, you know, clinic hours and, and, and then some. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, we spend a lot of time with you guys and, you know, similar to, you know, Deb that I worked with, you know, a lot of times we develop close relationships with yeah. you because of the things that we're, we're dealing with together and, uh, you know, the commitment that it takes from both sides. Right, right, exactly. And I, I, I'll, I'm going to send it to her again and perhaps you can just get some other ideas out there what that you've seen some success at with uh, other patients. And I'll put you yeah, so and I'll, uh, yeah. yeah, honey, to New York, do you want to move to Florida? I appreciate that, Robert. Yeah. I'll, I'll consider it. Um, one other aspect that I wanted to talk about um, that we had kind of alluded to before was, you know, this this thought process of when you can't do something or when you're having difficulty doing something. You know, one of the things that I've found to be um, helpful um, is uh, mental imagery and kind of envisioning you doing that task perfectly or moving in the way that you should move, um, you know, and kind of taking a moment to close your eyes, think about that movement. We talked about that connection between the brain and the body. And if you're having significant difficulty where you feel like maybe the exercises that you're doing or the tasks that you're trying to accomplish just isn't coming to fruition, you maybe need to spend some time with some mental imagery and envisioning you doing it well, and then try to uh, elicit that task because we know the effect that the brain can have. And we want to try to promote some sort of, uh, like we said, neuroplasticity or ability to do that task. And it, it definitely starts starts in the mind first. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, uh, it's amazing. Yeah. And Janice, I know, you know, Janice, the caregiver or husband, but also, um, um, I don't know, she, she had a comment that she has, it's like drop food now because of a, I think it was a nerve damage. So, um, yeah, that, that's, um, she's in the UK, but, uh, yeah, there's, a, if there's any other question, please ask because now is the time. <laughs> yeah, and that's if, right. And if you're wondering why my head is a little, it's actually, not too bad. Ash Wednesday, so yeah. my wife. And I'm, I'm going Wednesday. after this, Jerry. Are you? Yeah, yeah. All right. Here, here's um. But I'm gonna send this one more time. Sorry about this, but um, I'll throw back because I know you wanted to say a few other things. So yeah, yeah. You know, and go for it. Yeah. So, um, you know, we we were talking about it before. Uh, I've had a couple moments throughout my career and. Um, a lot of you guys have met Deb, who I got to work with, um, and there was a couple hallmark moments for me 
that really helps me to understand a little bit more of, you know, what some of the issues are and the difficulties that you may be facing. Um, you know, obviously nobody's walking in your shoes. So, um, a, until we see it, um, you know, cause we can't experience it for ourselves. Um, you know, it's, it's really eye opening. And so one of the stories I have is that, um, Deb and I were trying to work on more functional things like getting on and off a curb and going up and down steps in the community. Um, and we were able to get to a point where physically I knew for sure that Deb could do it. We had been doing it in the clinic. We had been, you know, working on specific things Her muscles were functioning better. Um, maybe some of the joints that were a little bit stiffer and weren't moving as well were moving better. Um, so we decided to take it out to outside of the clinic that I was working with her at. And, um, we went, uh, we set up a step on a curb. Um, and I'm not thinking anything of it at this point. I'm just going to kind of stand watch just in case, um, you know, she needs me to guard her or anything like that. But uh, again, I had full confidence in her to do it. And I kind of see a little bit of sometimes, uh, you guys may find that you get frozen. Um, and that when I realized what was going on was we were going to do this task. And as I looked around, I noticed that, um, everybody and their mother was staring at us and we're just trying to work on a task of physical therapy. We're just trying to get better. And everybody, there's a guy like peeking through the windows, staring at us. Somebody was coming up and talking to us, trying to tell us like a joke while we're doing a task. And I just want to speak to some of that like social pressure and social anxiety of when you're doing a task or you're trying to accomplish something and you you get that social pressure of people looking at you. And, and again, maybe that's not what they should be doing. And if they, you know, again, if they walked a mile in your shoes, they would be you know sitting there supporting you rather than kind of having that approach. But it is a reality that you do have to face. Um, so I, I would I would challenge you to try to try not to um, focus on that so much and try to focus on what you're doing and what you're accomplishing. You're the one that's trying to push yourself and, you know, focus on the task at hand, um, you know, and get, and get comfortable with being uncomfortable. It's not, um, it's not easy to do. And I, I, you know, I, I can't speak to it myself, but when I saw that with Deb, I was like, I get it now. Like, like this is what you're going through. This is what you're dealing with when you feel unsteady or you feel uncomfortable mm -hmm. and everybody's looking at you. It makes the situation so much worse. Um, and some of that social anxiety and pressure can actually affect you physically that you don't do the things that you probably could or know how to do. Yeah, I totally agree with you on that, about the social pressure. When you're trying to do this, right, therapists usually take, well, for me, took me outside to work on the stairs or something and people like are watching you and they don't know why I'm, you know, the way I am. And, uh, yeah. and get to a point where you say, you know what, I don't know if I want to do this in public anymore. And cause there's a lot of other things we have to worry about. So I'll just try to do it at home. And then we get, we go home and, you know, we need to be pushed by you, you know, as therapists. And that's, that's what I like. I'm sure everybody else does the same thing. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think there's, you know, there's always moments where we stumble and, you know, yeah. things don't go our way. And, you know, my suggestion is, you know, try not to do it on that too long, you know, give yourself uh, 24 hours and then, and then keep pushing forward because the reality is that you can't afford that. You can't afford to let um, anxiety or fear hold you guys back because it's so important to your recovery that you're willing to challenge yourself to get to where you want to be. Um, and I know a lot of those things can hold you back, even, you know, like we talked about the fear of falling, um, you know, so it's, it's, uh, it's important that you understand your risks, but at the same time, you don't, you know, pose, uh, such a guarded, uh, version of recovery that you're not able to progress. You, you want to, uh, you know, obviously do things safely, but you want to continue to challenge yourself. And, you know, that's why I said, utilize your therapist for that. Utilize your therapist to say, you know what? Either a this is kind of easy for me, and I or I need to challenge something different. You know, utilize that because that's what we're there for, and that's really the skilled time that we should be spending with you. Yeah. Is things that maybe you don't feel comfortable doing on your own, or maybe you succumb to that social pressure, and we need to coach you on what you need to focus on. Like in those moments, okay, focus on focus on your knee or focus on your hip and the way you need to right. move. It. You know, give you the task. Like this is what you need to do. Yeah, yeah. 
Nice, Chandra, nice to see you here. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, I mean, therapy is such a big part of our, you know, all brain injury survivors' life. And that's like the biggest thing besides eating. But uh, therapy, yeah. so, I mean, I don't know where to start because you guys make it all possible. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, it, it's a combination, right? You know, it's a combination of the work that you guys put in and, and us, you know, trying to set up a plan that's going to be effective for you and recalibrate when we need to, you know, and there, and there are times when, uh, when things come up and we need to, we need to problem solve. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Maureen, I see what you said that. Yeah, I totally understand about the rock in the way. Uh -huh. I mean, that's what we have to do is prepare, um, like, think about if someone says we're going to go to the, we're going to go take a walk, something. You don't yeah. have to worry about that. Um, not only the, our therapy, what we've learned from you and then, worry about the rock in the road you know because yes. we've been taught to step over things at least my therapy but now it seems that maybe that's weak on my part it's easier for me to just walk around because i don't want a chance fall yeah yeah or you know like i said maybe you work on something to a mimic that or you know um you know reset that up exactly so that when you feel confident the next time you're faced with that and I encourage you all to kind of log these things throughout the day. Like, okay, you know, how many times you come in contact with the rocks in front of you? Maybe, you know, you need to relay that that's what you need to work on, whatever the, the issue is. Yeah, I, exactly. I got to put this one up here. This is, uh, Deb is saying, this guy is the best therapist I had in nine years. <laughs> Thanks, um, Deb. Appreciate it. Awesome. I know. I, I wish I live closer you know <laughs> i always want to go back to new york she's never been there but yeah um, we'd love to you have know, you <laughs> yeah i want to show her my old house if it's still around there but yeah yeah but uh yeah so um yeah there's so many i see this that is my weakness she panics yeah marina you panic and don't want to fall i know i that's the biggest thing for me yeah because i've had I, I i besides seizures falling. I feel like I'm a pro at this, you know? Yeah. yeah I, I mean, we, we've had a, uh, we, another story is that we had a moment with Deb in the clinic where I was challenging her, um, to do something where she was kind of getting up from the floor. Wow. Um, and again, I, I, I try not to over guard her, um, so that we can allow for her to, again, maybe, uh, navigate that neuroplasticity and, and accomplish a task without having somebody right on top of you. Um, but at the same time, there's a fine line between making sure that she's safe and, you know, making sure that I'm not over assisting her. Um, and we had a moment where she, she did fall over in the clinic and I give Deb so much credit because obviously that's an entire room that turns around and looks at you. Right. And, um, I just had, uh, a moment myself where I was, you know, trying to learn how to snowboard last weekend and I fell all the way down the mountain and everybody's looking at you, you know, so that there is those difficult times where I think when you can walk away from those moments, you know, mm -hmm. obviously as long as you're not physically injured or obviously, you know, no fracture, things like that, you know, if you can walk away from that and say, you know what, some of this is part of paying the price to get to where I want to be and not necessarily be afraid of it, but maybe embrace some of those challenges and say, you know what, this happened because I'm trying, because I'm putting in the effort and that's going to get me places. Yeah, absolutely. And are you a big fan of doing in therapy, using, uh, doing planks, you know, on your, um, uh, you know, you're on your, a plank, you know, the, yeah, yeah, of course. Um, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a good exercise in general, um, you know, in terms of getting weight bearing through that side tends to challenge that side more. Uh, and anything I can do that's, you know, weight bearing, we kind of talked about that left side neglect before. Yeah. Um, you know, it, that's so common. Um, a lot of times I will set up things to encourage patients to utilize that specific side. Like for instance, like if we're doing a sit to stand, getting in out of a chair, you know, maybe they kind of put their um, uninvolved side forward and that involved side is the only one that's back so that they have to utilize that side and push through that side. Um, right. so it, it is important that we, you know, and I talked about kind of putting weight through that closed chain exercise is going to be more important and more functional. So being able to, you know, 
bear weight through that side and strengthen that side is going to be important. And whichever way you can challenge that and isolate what is uh, what you have a tendency to maybe not use is going to be super beneficial. Right, right. Um, you see Robert's question, what physical are you associated with? Is, is that probably the, the place that you're, you know, you can answer yeah. that one. I think that's yeah, 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 of course. I, so I work in an outpatient clinic uh, part time and then um, I try to do some visits on the side as well um, where I see patients in their homes also. Um, so that's, uh, that's pretty much, uh, two avenues that I, I, I work through, um, right now. So I get to see different, uh, different patient populations because of that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and right now, you know, some people aren't as comfortable going outside the home. So that's a, it's a good opportunity. Um, the other side of that is that, um, you know, when I get to see somebody in their home, that's their environment and that's where they need to do things. So a lot of times I get to see, you know, exactly what they're having difficulty with, not just the explanation. Yeah. I I know I probably, I asked, you know, someone else can ask these questions, but you, um, what's your feeling on about, um, well, for me going up a stair, my son, he had an apartment and he had to walk up the stairs. Yeah. One railing. Yeah. You know, so going up is easy, but going for me as far as the right side neglect, going down. How would I get down? I mean, I, I did it sideways, um, or I'd have to walk backwards because I have to hang onto the railing. I guess that's something. Well, yeah. So, so uh, yeah. I mean, you already you kind of jumped the gun on me. There's two two approaches would be if you have to go laterally down the stairs, um, you know, with your involved side going down uh, yeah. first. That's the reality because most of the weight's going to be on the leg that's up. Um, you know, you, you would probably want to utilize that if you can't go forward. Um, yeah. Backwards is a little um, less ideal for me, a yeah. because you just it's hard to see where you're going and see where you're placing things. Yeah. Um, and then a last resort if you're, you know, in a given situation, depending on you know what your physical capability is, a last resort would be what we call bottom scooting. Yeah. Um, which is where you sit down on the step and use your hand to get to the next step and slide down and then go that way. Obviously it's not the most ideal pattern, but if you're in a situation where, Hey, this is all I can do. And this is, I, I need to do this. Um, that might be an option. And again, that's something that should be practiced with your therapist yeah. uh, to make sure that we give you the guidance that you need to do it as safely as possible. Um, but yeah, I would, uh, starting with that lateral approach first, most likely. And then, uh, you know, it, it, if you had to in the worst situation, maybe trying a bottom scoot is what we call it. Right. And have my son carry me down. <laughs> yes. Yes. But, well, oh, shoot. I mean, it's been an hour already. So <laughs> Look already at going. that. That went fast. I know. We we, we need to do this again just because, uh, you know, I mean, we probably didn't cover half of, half of what. We yeah, about. there's probably so many other things we could talk about. And I love everybody's questions and how engaged everybody was and yeah. you know, be way more open to fielding some more of those questions. And maybe that sets up a future opportunity where we could answer some of people's questions that they have, maybe the most common ones that we see. Yeah. Um, so I'd, I'd love to do this again. Wow. Thank you, Marina. Yes. Yes. Thanks. Well, Marina. It's Patrick, you know. <laughs> I we just get the, the best guests out here, on here. And, oh. I mean, think about it. A, a doctor of physical therapy. I mean, we need more of you. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, uh, like I said, maybe we'll uh, we'll kind of encourage uh, getting on other physical therapists specific to other settings like a rehab or maybe somebody that, you know, does neurophysical therapy and works with us on a daily basis as well. Not that I don't see it, but I see it in the outpatient setting, yeah. um, which tends to be not as much. So I think there's other other experts that we could definitely get involved and get you guys some more more answers and maybe give you more advice uh, uh, on multiple different levels and capture you know, more than just uh, those who uh, only can attend outpatient. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you guys for being here. And uh, I appreciate any last, uh, or that was the last word. Do you have any last words of wisdom or anything? And then we'll, we'll yeah, just overall, like we talked about, you know, just to summarize, challenge your therapists, you know, try to keep a positive mindset and, and keep pushing forward. We know that 
you know, things don't happen overnight. So, you know, take, take the path of, you know, trying to grow each day and try to get a little bit better each day. If we look at that end goal all the time, you know, we're always going to be disappointed, but if you look at what you're trying to put in on a daily basis and do the work, you know, eventually you're going to get to where you need to be and eventually you're going to get more functional. And I encourage you guys to do that. Um, you know, I appreciate everybody's comments. I had a blast doing this. Would love to do this again. Jerry, I appreciate you and your group. And I love the work that you're doing. I think it's amazing. Um, and I feel blessed to be a part of it. Uh, me too. I mean, I, I'm, I'm glad I'm glad you were here. It was, it was yeah, me too. So absolutely. You guys have a great rest of your day or evening, I guess, here, there. Um, yes, definitely. Deb, we'll figure this out next time. Yeah, right? yeah Deb, we'll get you next time. Yeah. Uh, so, all right. Well, we'll see you guys later. And I'll just, we can just hang on one second there. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, for sure. Perfect. See you guys.